And um, again, I did not want to make this talk too technical. So um, for those of you who do know about machine learning and probabilistic graphical models and all that, I hope you will be able to understand the, the models from what I say, but I will not explain them in any great detail. I will just explain them what kind of assumptions they make and what they consist of, okay? So just, just maybe pretty pictures, uh, strange letters on the pretty pictures, which I will not explain, etc. The first pretty picture is Dr. Arpad Elo. Elo was um, a Hungarian mathematician. You know, Hungary produces excellent mathematicians for some reason. Um, it has the it, it, the uh, best density of Nobel laureates in the world. Uh, but still, Arpad Elo was a Hungarian mathematician in the 50s uh, who tried, who did exactly this for chess, okay? And you have all probably heard about the ELO rating. If you look at the ELO rating, how it is defined, like if you go to Wikipedia and read how, how to compute the ELO rating, you will just see a couple of strange formulas. A couple of strange formulas that actually have some constants built in. Uh, I, I, I don't even remember those. It doesn't really matter for us now. But uh, in essence, what the ELO rating does is it exactly tries to model Bayesian inference for the case of a game of two players, okay? So why it looks like, why it looks what it looks like um, is because back in the 50s, ELO had to approximate and simplify the inference. So uh, the players, and this probably uh, relates to computer games too, the players would like to know how their ratings are gonna change if they win, how they're gonna change if they lose, right? And now you can do any sort of crazy com computations in your smartphone, but of course in the 50s you could not, so he had to do some kind of approximations so that a chess player would be able to uh, just uh, estimate how his rating is gonna change after, after a game, okay? Um, but at the heart, if we strip it off of all of these approximations, at the heart, it's a probabilistic model. And let me walk you through this picture because this is the, es the essence of all um, Bayesian rating systems. Um, now look, the, on top you have the priors, okay? The prior distributions are, like they, are they are normal distributions. I won't even ask how many of you can write down the density of a normal distribution, but uh, the the point is that we have some kind of priors, we have some kind of prior ratings of the players. There are two players in, on, on this picture. Uh, one of them is on the left, the other is on the right. And this prior is about his true skill, okay? S1 and S2. What happened, so S1 and S2 are the variables, and the assumption is that a player does have a skill, okay? So the skill is not chosen just completely at random. Uh, the player has some innate well, skill that it might change with time, of course, but uh, at present uh, he has some innate skill. And the rating is our evaluation, is what we think about this skill. And we try to make it more precise with more and more games. What happens next, the second layer here, the P1 and P2, is correspond to the player's performance in a specific game, okay? So even, even if you have high skill, you might be tired or sleepy today, or you might be playing the best game of your life for some reason. So P1 and P2 are also random values that are centered around your true skill, but they do not have to be exactly a true skill, right? So th there is also some kind of distribution, again, a normal distribution, around the, the, the skill which produces the performance in this game. Okay, so you have the skill, which we want to estimate, and your performance in this specific game is a noisy uh, value which depends on the skill. Now next, okay, the third layer for now is trivial. This, is, this will be the team level, layer. And for now we have teams of one player, so I, I, uh, T1 is just equal to P1, and T2 is just equal to P2. And then the most interesting thing happens down here, okay? Uh, down here, we have the difference 
in performances, not in skills, in performances in the specific game between player one and player two. Okay, so D1 is just T1 minus T2. And, and the most interesting thing happens down here. Okay, so what does it mean that the first player won this game over the second? It means that his perfor performance in this specific game was higher than the performance of the second player. And this being chess, there is possibility of a draw, so it's not just greater than zero, it's greater than some, some constant. Okay, so what ELO did, and what was the mathematical contents of the ELO rating, was he actually computed the updates for this graphical model. I will not even try to explain what this means, but basically what he said, what, what, what he managed to uh, approximate was how will our beliefs about the ratings change, the beliefs about S1 and S2 change after we get this piece of data. This piece of data that in this specific game, P1 turned out to be greater than P2. Okay? Um, okay? Any questions at this point? All clear? Good. But you note, you notice that, and uh, this, this framework handles draws pretty well. It's no problem. Just if, 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 the, if it was a draw, then over here, we will not have d1 greater than epsilon. We will have d1 is between epsilon and minus epsilon, right? So the difference in performances is small, not large. Okay, but this was, of course, limited to two-player games. And now I move on to true skill, which, is, which was developed in Microsoft Research for the Xbox, uh, don't remember which specific games, Halo probably, uh, back in 2008 or seven. Uh, and this is basically a generalization of the ELO rating to team competitions. So you can see uh, that over here now we have the team layer and it actually matters. So now we have, for example, the first team consists of two players, P P1, P11 and P12, and the team performance is the sum of player performances. And the rest is exactly the same. And again, it's, it's a rather straightforward generalization in that uh, you just order the teams according to their final standings, and then some of this data will be that, for example, team one won over team two, and over here we have the teams two and three drew for second place, and then team four placed fourth behind teams two and three. Okay, so this is a straightforward generalization. It's, it's very much not straightforward mathematically because it's very hard to do inference on this graph. And there, there is this expectation propagation thing that um, an algorithm that can, can do inference here. But of course, I will not go into those details. So trust me, it works somehow. Magically, it works. Um, but of course, there are problems. And uh, this, this, this is where my personal story begins. So this is, this is where uh, me and my friend Alexander Sirotkin came into this picture. Um, we tried to apply true skill to what, where, when. And on paper, it, it looked perfect. It was a, a, a rating system specifically designed for team competitions. Well, in reality, it turned out far from perfect. And the main problem is uh, actually so simple, I, I think I can explain it with virtually no math at all. So if, if you look at the graph before, over here, you can see down here that if teams two and three had a draw, they drew for second place, then the difference between them was supposed to be not greater than epsilon, right? And then suppose that teams three and four also drew, and so the difference between them is also not, not at most epsilon, but Due to the structure of the graph, it means that the difference between team two and team four is now two epsilon, right? There can be one epsilon here and one epsilon here. So it's twice more. And when you have multi-weight ties, like I explained, when you have teams sharing places from 10 to 35, this, this is a very bad thing, okay? So basically, this means that there is absolutely no uh, constraint on, or, or, on the performances. 
So we solved this problem, and uh, we just added a new layer to, to the model. I will not go into details, but this was my first serious paper in machine learning back in 2011, and that's, that's very nice. Um, okay, so brief recap. This is about half of my talk, so brief recap. We've, we have formulated the rating system as a Bayesian inference problem. Okay? We have proposed a solution for team games, true skill. We have identified some of the problems, at least the multi-way type problem, and solved it, but other problems still remained. For example, the problem of undersized teams. In true skill, as you have seen, uh, team performance is just the sum of player performances, which doesn't make much sense in our game, and probably in many computer games it also doesn't make much sense. So would a team of five players be one point 25 better than a team of four players. Not quite, I think. So we moved, uh, we generalized from just sums to weighted sums, but it, it's a hack. It, it did not, it's, it's, it's not a good principled solution. Uh, and also, it was not clear how to add scores. So the only data that we use is how much the team, uh, is what is the order of the teams, right? Who plays first, who was second, who was third? And it was not really clear how to transfer the actual scores which we had. They were available, and they will be available in your games. Uh, how to tra translate the scores into the difference in performances. We tried, of course, but it was also very far from perfect. So at that point, I went on to thanks, and a few years later, I returned to look at, uh, at, at, at my favorite hobby again and to see what has changed. And I have found that, of course, uh, that, that over these few years, the problem, the rating problem for my game has changed completely, has changed 100%. What happened? Uh, people people started, started to record more detailed information. Okay, so people started to actually record not only the results. So in a uh, in a tournament of uh, I don't know 48 questions, team one answered 42 of them, team two answered 37, etc. But they also started to record what specific questions the team answered, and this just led to a completely different model. So I will probably just weed through the actual model, because, again, pro probably this, this is not the audience, but uh, I do have the slides about it, but I wanted to make an important general point, uh, which is do not fight the data, okay? So h here you see KG, uh, a very famous Go player, number one in the world now, who tried to fight the data and lost uh, hopelessly recently. Uh, but uh, the important general point is that you should not fight the data, okay? Uh, if your data changes, if your inputs change, you should reevaluate everything from scratch. We, we, we could try to somehow incorporate this question by question results into true skill. It would be very difficult. Maybe we could pull it off, maybe not. But actually, what you should do when, when the input conditions change, you should reevaluate the thing from basic principles, and probably if new data comes in, you can add, uh, you, you can just completely change the model. And we did complete, and I did completely change the model in 2015. I will not go through this because pro probably this is not very interesting for you. But basically, uh, what what I could now do is I could actually add the event that a specific team answered a specific question. And now I could explicitly add the variables for how hard the question was, right? And I could specifically add variables for which player answered the specific question. Uh, this, these variables are not known. They are latent variables. But again, machine learning has many tricks. One of the tricks is how to work with models with plenty of latent variables. And this, of course, worked even better. Uh, because more data was available, although it was a much simpler model. Okay, so uh, okay, so recap again. We have seen a complicated model based on relatively scanned data, based on only team standings in the result of a competition, and we have seen a much simpler model, which was based on richer data, which solved the problem even better. 
And this is, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm nearing the end, don't worry. So this is more or less and state of the art in Bayesian rating systems, okay? So the true skill probably, uh, true, and our modification of true skill is probably the state of the art. And uh, this is just a simple model which followed from our specific information that we had from the specific uh, form of our, of our own problem. So I'd like to finish with uh, an idea of what we can do in computer games. So how this relates to computer games. Naturally, you can just take true skill, better take our modification, it's much better, uh, and not, not much harder. So you can take true skill, and uh, you can just plug it in and uh, use it in your game. But probably, you being the developers, you have much more detailed information about what's going on in the game, right? And this is the main, probably, takeaway point of, of my talk. Uh, since, you, since you have this information, which is shown on the bottom right as this abstract picture of data, uh, this information could probably be very useful in, in doing the ranking thing. But again, probably in your case, in case of games like World of Tanks or Dota 2 or some competitive game which is going on now, probably the detailed data will be much more complicated than just a series of unrelated questions, right? And uh, you would need a more complicated model. And this is where, of course, the very hyped deep learning could help. Because basically what deep learning is, is the art of constructing suitable neural networks. And the neural network is a universal approximator for anything. And this universal approximator, if we do it right, could also be used to, well, to, to do a rating system, to infer the posterior ratings, to, to make an update after results, and uh, also do the more direct problem, probably the problem of team skill prediction, right? So uh, given such and such players who have such and such features, because again, in your games, probably the players, probably the players have different roles, they use different equipment, they use different tanks, or they play different characters, whatever. So th there are extra also external features which are known and which make the players different, right? So this all also should come as input to the system. And uh, again, since you, the developers, have probably huge data sets, two, one, two, <laughs> probably have huge data sets of game results, I'm sure that even a more complicated model, even a deep neural network with all the bells and whistles, can be trained, and we can take, we, we can train a model that would actually rather reliably predict the performance of a team given all of these features of how it turned out. Okay? So, uh, you could try to do it together. This is more of an open-ended talk, which is more of a proposition of a joint project, I guess. And um, with that, I reiterate my takeaway points. So the first point is probably not so relevant here in the gaming industry conference, because all of you are following your passions. <laughs> but on a mathematical conference, I usually would say that don't be afraid to work on what you love. And this is a, a project, a purely, for me, it started as a purely hobby project about a game whom nobody outside Russia has ever heard about, or well, outside the Russian-speaking world has, has ever heard about. But it, it, it did lead to my first good paper on machine learning. Second, try to collect more data, because more data means not only better accuracy, but it also might mean a radically simpler or radically different model, which, uh, and again, when you collect more data, you have to reevaluate what you have, do not fight the data, work with it, go where, follow it, go, go where it leads you. And of course, take away point number four, all of this could be directly applicable to any kind of competitive gaming, and I hope we can work on this together. Thank you.
Okay, thank you so much, Sergey, for the presentation. And uh, well, guys, it's evening already. And uh, yes, questions. <laughs> we have some more minutes. <laughs> I was on time, come on. I mean, my question is going to be super basic. It won't be really complicated, but there is a bunch of people here who think that you actually missed the most interesting slides in your presentation <laughs> and would love to hear you talk a bit about them. So maybe after other question end, the next uh, session starts in 25 minutes. Yeah, so if we have like maybe 10 or 15 minutes, you can quickly talk about what you did there. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Let's just maybe... Um, Let's, uh, let's have some more questions now, if, if, if the audience has them, and then I will continue with the secret slides. Of course. Uh, May I ask my question in Russian? Am I right? My understanding, so by doing e-learning, we can seek the information and predict the results of the next games, but I didn't get it. How can we how the uh, players' ra rating will change based on this data. Okay, so um, it, it's difficult to answer exactly how because it would require like a whole lecture on, on machine learning, but uh, the, the idea is that you have some prior belief about the rating, which is up, up there in, in the very top. This is your current state of mind, what you think about the skill of this specific player. Then he plays a game, and he wins. So your estimate of his skill should go up, right? And that's exactly what happens. <laughs> so uh, all of this is the mathematical machinery to make it happen. So this is the Bayesian update to your prior beliefs about your specific player after you get new evidence. And the evidence is that he won this specific game. And he won, so, and you, go, can, you can propagate this evidence up and return to the uh, to the parameters, and the parameters are the ratings. Okay, more questions? All right, I also ask it in Russian. Uh, uh, I would like to ask about this system would work if uh, for teams. Uh, if all participants of a team are clones uh, and they are not profiled, they are not different. If we take a team of consisting of different players uh, who have different profiles, then performance could uh, change tremendously depending on their composition. And then we cannot predict in such uh, environment. Uh, um, uh, the, the question was, uh, what, what if different people, different players in, in the team have different specializations? How, how will the model reflect it? Well, uh, the model over here is very simple. It does not reflect it. Okay, here, you're, correct, you're exactly right. All the players are clones. And over here, too, all the players are clones. But there is nothing that prevents us from developing a model where the input would be not only the idea of a player, but also some other uh, parameters about this specific game. And then the model can take them into account. For example, this specific player is good on one subset of characters in Dota and bad on the other subset of characters. But you know the character that he played in this game, so you can take it as input to the model, and the model can learn it, if, if I understood your question correctly. And also, it, of course, can, can learn the interactions between players. OK, sure. More questions? So I suppose we, we should switch on the most interesting okay. slides that you let us, missed. OK, let, let us go back to, to the most interesting slides. Uh, actually, I, I, I did plan to talk about them, but I decided to skip because this was like pure math, and uh, I, I already was like halfway through or more. So let, let me go back to those. Um, the model simplifies greatly when you have question-by-question question results, because now you, have, you can introduce actually the variables that um, a specific that, that are denoted x t q here, which which means that player um, x i q it should be sorry <laughs> that player i 
uh, answered question Q. Okay, I'm sorry, it should be X I Q. So uh, the first the first version of this of the simplified model was just this, just a basic classification, basic logistic regression. You take the uh, how hard the question is, which is uh, CQ here. You take the skill of a player, which is SI here, and those put together, uh, well, okay, CQ is how easy the question is, and those put together determine how probable it is that player I will answer question Q, okay? And this is exactly the model of logistic regression, which is one of the most basic classification models. Um, but of course, this is not quite satisfactory because there are no teams here. So this model kind of assumes that everybody on a specific team answered the same questions, which, which doesn't make sense. So to add the teams here, we introduce latent variables. Okay, so it's the same model. Again, Z, I, Q, is also the event that player i answered question q, but now we don't know the iq. Okay? But we do have some constraints on them. And the constraints are, again, very straightforward and logical. The constraints are that if the team had the correct answer, it means that at least one of the players answered. Right? So at least one of, of the z's should be equal to one, but not, of course not all of them. And uh, the other assumption, which is less obvious, but let's make it, uh, if the team had the wrong answer, it means that nobody answered, okay? So basically the team answer is like an or, a logical or of all, of all the uh, ZIQs. And uh, you get a model where you have a very simple model, basically, the uh, logistic regression, but uh, you don't know ZIQs, they are latent, okay? And this is somewhat similar to what is called the presence-only models in, for example, ecology. Like when you estimate where, I don't know, a certain breed of rabbits live. And if you see a rabbit of, of, of this kind, then they live here. But if you have never seen a rabbit here, they might live there, they might not. You don't know. So you have only one-sided one data. You, you know, uh, in this case, for example, uh, if if the team did not get the question, then you know that it's zero for everybody. But if the team got the question, you don't know who exactly did it. Okay. But uh, the answer is still the same. <laughs> and the answer to this kind of models where you have a, a simple basic model with lots of latent variables is almost invariably the expectation maximization algorithm, the EM algorithm in machine learning, which is an iterative procedure which basically says that on the E step, on the expectation step, you fix your current model parameters and you estimate the unknown variables, the latent variables. So in this case, you fix the ratings, you fix the uh, ratings and the estimates of how hard the questions are, and you just evaluate how likely it was for a specific player to get a specific question, given all the data and given uh, fixed current estimates of S and C. And then, and then uh, you do the other thing. You fix these and you re re retrain the S and C. And this again is just straightforward logistic regression. Okay? Uh, so then you iterate, you, you, you make this procedure uh, run for a few uh, loops and you're done. So it, it, it can be proven that this increases the, like the total likelihood of the model. So at some point it converges to a local maximum of the likelihood. Basically it works, okay? Uh, so this, this is a very straightforward application of the EM algorithm, but surprisingly I have not seen it before. So this, this was somewhat new. Okay, that was it. More Are questions? you satisfied, guys? Yeah. <laughs> cool. Okay, so I'm afraid that we, we don't have more time. Well, for four other questions. So, thank you so much. Thank you, guys, for inviting for me.
we're here with another one of uh, the participants on 4C. Hi, please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jean-Philippe Morel from Ubisoft Montreal. I'm working on uh, Rainbow Six Siege. Uh, very nice. Uh, what was your first uh, video game ever? Do you remember it? Oh my god. I did a port of a very... Oh no, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> it was called War Chess. It, I don't know if anyone knows about it, but uh, it's just a port of a, of a PC game to console game on PS2 or like uh, 15 years ago. Uh, but my first real game, I would say, was uh, I worked on Prince of Persia, uh, several P Prince of Persia at, uh, at Ubisoft. That's very nice. Uh, what was your uh, first video game that you've played? Oh, the first that I've played? Oh. On the Atari uh, 2000... Uh, 2,000, two, I don't know if I say it correctly in English. Uh, it, it, it was called a Smurf. <laughs> That's an old one. Yeah, it's a real old one. Yeah, it's an old one. And well, now that the time has passed, uh, what's your favorite video game of all time? Do you have one? Of all time? Oh my God, that's a good question. Um, I would say I, I spent a lot of time playing Unreal Tournament a while ago, but yeah, Unreal Tournament. The very first one? Yeah, the very first one. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, what led you to the video game industry? How did you come here? Oh, it's a technical challenge. The technical challenge is I first wanted to make graphics, but I realized that was, that was not really my, my thing. I, 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 I like to build machines, like ma machines that can scale, that can live for a long time. The technical challenges in, in video game industry is... Uh, and uh, now that you're in it, um, what's your favorite thing about the industry? What do you like most about it? It's the same thing, exactly what I said. It's building machines, building bigger machines, machines that scales. Um, I'm not even that interested in the nature of the game. That may disappoint you, but it's, it's more the machine that I'm building that, uh, that interests me. And, I have a lot of creative people around me to make some good games. So, so it's the technical side of things that you're yeah, into? Exactly. exactly. All right. Um, so anything you particularly don't like about the modern state of the industry, maybe? Hmm. Uh, I, worked in a, uh, I work with really, really big te teams. Uh, it's not really that I don't like them, but I, I prefer some smaller scale team probably, but that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, um, what else? Oh, that's pretty much what I'm thinking about now. Fair enough. Uh, let's make some predictions. Uh, what do you think will be the new thing, the new big thing, the new trend in the gaming industry in like 10 years time? Oh, in a 10 years time? Well. I'm not, I, I won't say it's new, but I, I think there will be more and more games that lives for a very long time, that, that evolves that over time. And uh, I think that's a trend that will continue over the, the next years. Uh, do you think it will be like a breakthrough point uh, through some game, or it's just going to be like a slow progressional uh, evolution into this state? I think it's going to be a slow evolution, and that's... Yeah, I think it's going to be a slow evolution, mostly because we need to adapt to that kind of uh, mentality in the game industry. And uh... Fair enough. Uh, if you had absolute creative freedom, which I don't know, maybe you have, uh, but still, like absolute creative, financial, uh, professional freedom, what game would you like to have made? I will keep that secret, if you don't mind. We almost had an announcement here. <laughs> I have, a, I have, a, I have a good ideas, but I, I will keep that for myself. <laughs> okay, but that's a secret then. Uh, is it a secret uh, on what do you think is more important in games, like uh, graphics or gameplay or uh, maybe the storytelling? No, I think it's uh, the <coughs> everything is building a community and uh, make it that community grows and grows and grows and make that community uh, as more well, grows over time and. So uh, we can build on that for many years on the same kind of titles. Okay, great. Uh, uh, let's uh, return to the real world for a second from video games. Uh, we're in St. Petersburg. What do you think about the city? Oh, uh, we, we had a good time yesterday. 
I was just trying to find a good place to go and uh, it's awesome. We had a, a tour of the whole city, we had a boat trip, it was awesome. It was awesome, really. Right. What about the event itself for C? I know it just started, but uh, still any impressions? Oh, I can't wait to see. Uh, I can't wait to see the talk uh, f Friday and Saturday. I want to know more about, like, yeah, the, what people think about the future of gaming, of gaming industry. Maybe something specific you're looking forward to, some uh, specific speech or lecture. Yeah, I'm very interested about monetization. How? Monetization, the big, that, 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 you know, I, I told you I like big machines, build big machines, and monetization is one's something that we need to learn a lot, uh, how it works, uh, how we integrate that to game, and uh, I'd like to see how other developers are, are doing that. Some massive uh, online infrastructure also, I want to see, uh, I want to hear more about that, how people doing that. Uh, if you were interviewing yourself right now instead of me, uh, what would you ask yourself? Um, at what time is the party? To, uh, at what time is the party uh, Saturday? Well, I guess you'll have to answer this question yourself. <laughs> Either way, I have you have a great time at the party, and you have a great time at the event itself. Uh, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, thank you very much. catching our speakers in the hallway and putting cameras in front of them. Hi, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Samuel Rantaskla. I work for uh, Microsoft as a principal program manager out of Sweden. Okay, Samuel, so let's talk about games. What's your favorite game? Well, I wish I played a lot more games than I actually do, so I have to go back into the past. Like, one of my m really favorite games is Jag the Lions 2 from like 92, 93. I think it was made here in Russia, if I'm not mistaken. Civilization, always been a big fan of that. And then the Enemy Unknown UFO trilogy from the 90s. There's so many games, I mean, it's like impossible to select one. But they're all strategic games, the ones that are my favorite. Yeah, you're obviously a tactician. That's commendable. But do you remember the very first game you've ever played? Uh, Decathlon, probably on the x86, somewhere around 84. Wow, that's... Uh I don't even remember that one. Um, oh, it's like a, you basically play uh, decathlon and you just hammer at the keyboard to go faster, like 10, 10 different sports events. Played it like crazy. I was eight years old then. <laughs> wow. Uh, how did you get in the, uh, into the gaming industry? It was by chance, actually. So I was studying at Uppsala University doing uh, computer science. And they had this fair uh, where companies were meeting the students. And there was these two guys that they've started a game company in the basement and they wanted somebody to write a BSP tree, binary space partitioning tree. And I was looking for my thesis, so I figured let's combine those. So I joined them, I wrote my thesis uh, in the games industry, and then from there on it kind of like just went on. So this was 2000. 
Uh, but now in 2017, what's your favorite and least favorite thing about game dev? I mean, I think the games industry is awesome. Great place to work. There's so much passion. Um, there's skilled, very intelligent people. Uh, I think that's my favorite thing. Uh, the least favorite thing is that, which I covered in my speech a little bit, I think that we're looking a little bit too much at how do we turn time into money. Uh, rather than seeing like how do we how do we educate our kids I really want to that's my passion myself is like take this experience make our kids better today tomorrow than they are today I'm a parent as well so that's coming from that well that's a very noble thing to do I don't know if noble just I think it would be a good thing for us definitely is um, about your speech did you have any interesting questions that maybe stood out yeah there was some uh, interesting questions like if we look at mixed reality, what's going to happen with that? Where, where, what's the dangers with that? I couldn't really answer them because it's, let's see what happens. But if you were a part of your own audience, what question would you like to ask yourself? Hmm, that was a tricky one. Um, are you sure that you're right? Are you? No. Well, we can be sure 100%, but still, we're trying to foresee the future here. How do you like the conference? Love it. St. Petersburg, great place. Wargaming, excellent hosts. It's a great place to be. You should come to the next one. Definitely do. Uh, say, if you had the chance to go back in time uh, to when you just started working in the industry and give yourself one advice, what would it be? Try one of your ideas out. That's very good. Thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, I hope you like the conference. Thank you.